Our reading today is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up your shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Simon. I'm one of the ministers here, and I'm delighted to be sharing with you this morning. If you have a Bible, please turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, we've been in a series called Blessings and Battles. We really enjoyed the studies on blessings. Uh, It's been uh, heavy going through the battles, but sometimes you've got a battle in order to experience God's blessing. I do recommend, uh, if you haven't uh, seen it online or you weren't here last Sunday and Sunday before, to uh, follow up on uh, Rector Stephen's two sermons introducing the nature and character of the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in, and then last week introducing us to the arms and the armor with which God equips us in order to stand and to fight. Let's pray, and then we'll get stuck in. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. And we bless you, Lord, today. And we ask that you'd draw even closer to us, and that you'd open your word, and by your spirit you would speak to us, that you'd open our eyes and you'd open our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, a few years ago, I was invited to go and speak to the uh, British troops who were serving at the time in Afghanistan. And I agreed, but in the end, things got... um, uh, it, It didn't happen, but... When I was invited, I asked the colonel who invited me, I was speaking out in Germany to the British troops at the time, and uh, I said, will I be at the rear with the gear? He said, come out and speak. I said, am I at the rear with the gear? And uh, he replied, and I wrote it down, there is no rear. It's a 360 degree sphere of combat. Every military personnel, whether a cook or a driver is armed. They are a combat soldier first. And what we've seen in this series over the last few weeks is that all Christians are born again into the warfare of God. We are all called to fight the good fight, or more literally, as the text says, war the good warfare. And there is a war that rages, as Stephen explored with us two weeks ago. And it rages between the forces of darkness and evil and the forces of light, between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of darkness, between what St. Paul calls the evil forces in the evil day and the evil one against the beautiful one, King Jesus. And faced with an enemy, we need armor and we need armaments. When Russia 
invaded the Ukraine, the Americans offered to evacuate President Zelensky out of Kyiv. And uh, some of you remember that he famously uh, replied, the fight is here. I need ammunition and not a ride out. The fight is here. And what we need is ammunition and armor. And God doesn't evacuate us from this contest that we find ourselves in a spiritual contest in the heavenly realms that is played out in the everyday natural. The fight is upon us, and God has given us everything that we need to protect, to defend, to equip us to advance. And Stephen opened up the armor of God last week. I want to think about three uh, aspects that we're equipped with. And first, we're told to take up the shield of faith. We're told to take it up to extinguish the flaming darts, the arrows of the evil one. And your faith personally and the faith is under fire. Faith in the faith. Faith is belief. It's both a verb and a noun. It's the believing and it's what we believe in. And both of these things are targeted by the demonic in the spiritual battle. Both of them are attacked and opposed and undermined. The faith itself what we believe, the gospel, the good news, the revelation that comes to us through Jesus Christ and our act of assent and trust and commitment to that. Both of these things are attacked by the enemy. And Paul offers this image of fiery arrows, as it were, that are fired against it. We're probably to think in terms of arrows. Um, the, the word that's used there for these fiery darts could mean missiles or sort of hand bolts, but they're fiery. And um, when the Romans were fighting, they often would face enemies who would send a hail of arrows, many that had been dipped in tar and ignited, so that there wouldn't just be the impact of the penetration of the arrow that would wound, but then the fire would spread. And this is an image that Paul picks up. And he says that we are facing these flaming arrows of the enemy coming at us from each and every direction. And we're to lift up the shield of faith. The evil one, the enemy, opposes the faith and opposes those who hold faith, who believe and trust in Jesus and fires these darts at us. Why? Why does he do it? Why is he so incandescent, fizzing with rage? I think it's out of spite and out of jealousy, out of fear. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the disarming and the defeat of the evil one. And the gospel brings deliverance from his evil snares and brings us into life. He seeks to bring death. It brings us into life. He seeks to lie and deceive. The gospel brings us into truth. He seeks to bring darkness and oppression. The gospel brings us into freedom and light. And the gospel, the faith, the belief, that Jesus brings to us is the undoing of all the undoing that the enemy has wrought. It reverses every curse that he has sought to bring upon us. Until Jesus returns and makes everything new and finally destroys the demonic, we will be at war. We will find ourselves in this contest and in this conflict, the faith itself and the faithful, those who put their faith in the faith, 
will undergo opposition. And this comes in various ways, all attempting to suppress the faith, to push it down and to oppress the faithful. We see it particularly in kind of ideological forms with competing worldviews that would seek to diminish, disdain, push to one side the Christian faith. All sorts of isms, obviously atheism, that tells us that faith is a fairy tale and which is a direct assault on the faith. It says there's no basis for that faith. There is no God. There is no Jesus. There is no salvation. You are just, you know, the product of sort of, you know, random in infinity, in eternity. That life came into a pond and grew legs and crawled out and eventually became us and that there is no God anywhere in that trajectory. Atheism. And in the public eye, uh, there are public historians and scientists, and they're all pontificating, trying to undermine what we believe in, the fact of belief. Secularism, of course, that says faith is to play no role in society beyond that of a private hobby on the level of golf or tiddlywinks or something. <laughs> Anyone? Got a hobby in tiddlywinks? <laughs> you know at Oxford at one time you could get a half blue in tiddlywinks. <laughs> Totalitarianism, which is the imposition of I an ideology that's often opposed to Jesus and the gospel, whether it's Islamism or communism or fascism or anarchism or any other sort of ism that you can think of that seeks to undermine the faith and the faithful. Materialism is so prevalent here in the West and hedonism where the gospel and trust in Jesus is supplanted and replaced by the pursuit of pleasure and the acquisition of stuff. Anything that seeks to make you bow to an idol and an ideology rather than to King Jesus. And along with aiming at the faith itself, the believer's believing is in the enemy's sights. He wants to intimidate us. He wants to der deride our faith. He wants to tempt us away from Christ, to lure us into all sorts of avenues and alleyways that turn out to be dead ends. He wants to bring doubt into our life. Did God really say, can you really trust in God? No, you can't. And to make us put our trust elsewhere. An undermining and an attack on the believing of the believer and to compromise their faith and practice. And Paul says, verse 16, take up, raise up, the shield of the faith. Not just the shield of faith, but it's actually a definite article there. The faith, the one and only faith. The faith which Paul had proclaimed in Ephesus. The gospel, the creed, what we believe. And as we saw last week, brilliantly illustrated, Paul is probably chained to a Roman soldier and he's looking at this Roman soldier's kit and he's trying to draw an analogy of correspondence to help his uh, hearers and readers understand and make connections. Here is a warrior, a soldier that he's chained to, and he's looking at his kit, and he's saying, think of your protection in the way that this Roman soldier made for war is protected. Take up the shield of faith. Roman legionnaires had a shield. It was four foot tall by two and a half foot rectangular iron frame studded with uh, brass and iron brackets covered in canvas, then covered in leather and often soaked in water before battle so that it could extinguish the fiery darts that came. Interestingly, the Greek word for shield, uh, thurios, is, is the word for door. You lift up a door and you shut the door 
on the attack. You shut the door on the enemy. And it's counterintuitive, but Paul says that when your faith is under fire, lift up your faith. You step into the breach that the enemy is seeking to attack. You fight fire with fire. You, when, when your faith in God is pushed, you push back at that point of attack. And how do we do that? Well, we do it through worship, and we've already uh, had that illustrated, and we've been led into that this morning in our time of praise and worship by Paul. That worship is warfare. I knew of a man who fought in World War I uh, many years ago, hearing this story and the uh, things that he saw. He fought at Vimy Ridge, terrible slaughterhouse, and shadows came upon him. And he would have to get up in the night and go downstairs and sing the songs of the faith, sing the great hymns from Redemption Hymnal. And I remember a friend saying at the time, where are the songs that get you through the night when the demons come? And they do come to attack us, to undermine our belief, our believing in the belief. And worship, we worship ourselves out of that place of doubt and fear and depression. It's counterintuitive. Often we want to go and do something else, but as we worship, we find that the clouds, the shadows, the oppression, the attrition, the affliction can begin to lift off us. And then we need to remember, we remember in the darkness what God did for us in the light. This is a theme we find constantly in Scripture, that when the pressure's on, they remember. They look back to what God has said and what God has done, and they hold on to that, and they pray. We're going to be thinking about this more next week. They pray that God would make it a reality in their life now and bring it to pass for the future. And then we share our faith. Nothing builds up my faith like sharing the faith with others who don't have faith. And I find that even as I explain and express my faith, that I reappropriate it for myself. And it becomes more real to me. In Sun Tzu's Art of War, a classic text on military warfare that I'm sure most of you have read, um, he says, attack is the secret of defense. Attack is the secret of defense. Defense, he says, is the planning of an attack. And when the enemy is against us, and, and, bringing, and whether it's some form of ideology or hegemony, personal undermining in our mind or in our experience, that actually as we share the faith, as we speak it out in worship, as we remember what he's done, we find our own faith in the faith bolstered. One of the most important things is to lean on our friends. The Roman shields, the door, Thurios, they interlocked. One of the great reasons why the Romans were so efficient and effective and victorious in warfare for several centuries, they just understood the need to stand together. Not every man for himself, let's have a go, but they fought as one and the shields all interlocked. They called it the tortoise and it worked and we need one another. The enemy, when he attacks us, will seek to isolate us. And we need to actually push further into fellowship. I have a friend, one of England's most effective evangelists, but every now and again, every six months, he would just suddenly be attacked by the enemy, often after a season of great effectiveness and fruitfulness in ministry. And he would begin to doubt And the enemy would lie to him and say, you've been saying all this, but it's not true, and it's not true in your life, and you're a liar, and you're a fake, and you're misleading, and it would just come upon him. And he would ring me up, and he would say, Simon, tell me it's true. Tell me it's true. I'd say, it's true. He said, yes, it is true. If you believe it, it must be true. And he'd be back in. But the enemy is subtle. He knows our weak spots. He often goes for where we think we're most strong. But we need each other and we lean on the other. 
C.S. Lewis, in his great little book, Screw Tape Letters, it's an allegory of um, a sort of senior demon training a younger demon. Screw Tape training this young wormwood on how to attack uh, Christians and to undermine their faith in God, who they call the enemy. And there's a great line. Uh, they're talking tactics, and screw tape. this older demon says, you must focus all your energy on attacking his faith. Remember, if the patient just looks to the enemy, who is God, with faith, even weak faith, the enemy will immediately strengthen him, comfort him, help him, and your flaming darts will just bounce off him. When the faith is under attack, we lift the shield of faith and we press into it. I'm going to talk next week about how prayer is central to that. And then secondly, take up the helmet of salvation. We need to remember who we are. We need to remember whose we are. We need to remember what God has done for us. The helmet of, uh, of salvation protects us from all the accusation and condemnation of the demonic and indeed the manipulation of the evil one. What does salvation mean? Well, in English it literally means rescue. And Jesus is the rescuer, and at the heart of our faith is this belief that God in Christ Jesus has acted to rescue us from the enemy and bring us into his kingdom. And that he's got, not only is it a rescue from, but it's a rescue for a life with God, a life of goodness and blessing blessings and battles, a life full of blessing that he has stored up for us. One of my favorite verses that illustrates this is in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Verse 14, he says, God has delivered us from the powers of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. We have been brought out and we have been brought in. We've been delivered and then we've been given this eternal life and an eternal kingdom. Delivered, transferred, redeemed and forgiven. But the enemy who despises that, who despises the fact that he's lost his grip on us and his hold over us will come and lie. He's the father of lies. And he lies to us and he tells us, yeah, but it's not true in your case. He hasn't really rescued you. And he'll whisper that somehow we're his. He'll say, you're mine. You're under my control. But salvation means we're delivered. That we are set free like a bird out from the cage. And that we're under new management that Jesus is our Lord, and we now take all our instructions only from him. The evil one lies to us and says that we're sinful, that we're stained, that we continue to do wrong, and that we're covered in shame, and that he just seeks to pile on condemnation. The helmet of salvation says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. If the devil reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future. <laughs> the evil one lies and says you're lost and you're all alone. And we say no. The helmet of salvation says I am now part of a great people, a great family, and a son and daughter of the living God. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> the, old company, the old loan company cannot chase you for interest because the debt is paid. And the old boss cannot tell you what to do because you work for someone else. And the old partner cannot claim your affections because you are wed to Christ. And when the demonic comes and whispers, 
or sometimes shouts loudly and wants to undermine our belief, our believing in the belief and who we are and our position and our identity and our security. We remember the helmet of salvation. We're not Christians because of anything we did. We're Christians simply because we said yes to the God who said yes to us in Christ Jesus. And we've looked to the cross and we've looked to Christ and we've looked to his blood and we've looked to his gracious offer and we've said yes, forgive me, cleanse me, come into my life, save me, rescue me and deliver me because I'm lost without you. And he says, great, that's why I came. In the 17th century, John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, one of the greatest pieces of English literature, it, it, it's again an allegory of the Christian life through the trials of faith, and Bunyan himself knew all about that 12 years in a prison in Bedford Jail because he, uh, for preaching the gospel in an unlicensed Anglican con- non-Anglican context. What a tragedy. Anyway, whilst there, he wrote this book. And actually, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress to encourage himself, as well as to encourage others. But he says this, Christian, this character, had stopped his progress, and it was as if he would go back. And then someone cried out, do not, there were these two lions stopping his way, and he was full of fear, these prowling, roaring lions. And he says, do not fear the lions, for they are chained and are placed there to test your faith and discover those who have none. Keep in the middle of the path. Keep on with the faith. Keep believing in the belief. And no harm will come to you. It says, so Pilgrim went on his way. The enemy comes like a lion and he roars and he tries to stop us, but through the cross he is chained. He can make a lot of noise. He can bring intimidation, but he can't undo the work of salvation, and we can walk between him. And then lastly, and very briefly, let's take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, former student over at Christ Church and a chaplain up at Lincoln and Part of the Holy Club Methodism was birthed here in this city in a renewal that Wesley helped lead. He says, you cannot win if you don't fight. The helmet of salvation is to protect us. The shield of faith is to protect us. But the sword of the Spirit is both to protect and to advance. It's the one weapon that we have here along with the shoes fitted with the readiness of the gospel. And this is the weapon of our warfare. Uh, This sword, which is God's word to us. And we need to study it. And we need to savor it. And we need to remember it so that we've got something to draw on when the shadows come. And this book, written over 1,500 years by a couple of dozen different authors yet somehow we believe is inspired by God and that there is a unity and it's wed together by the Spirit of God and it's been given to us. And this is the most powerful thing in the universe. And here is truth that undermines lies and here is hope that dispels despair and here, as it were, is an open door into the very heart of of God. This is the word of God with instruction and direction for life. And we need to be people of the book, people of the Bible, people of the word of God for ourselves. Every Roman soldier had a sword. It isn't just for the vicars and the pastors and the priests and the Bible study leaders and whatever. We have access to this and we need to avail ourselves of it. You know, when Jesus was suffering severe temptation and the demonic came to test him, Jesus repeatedly said, it is written. He was quoting scripture. He was actually quoting Deuteronomy, which is one of the most challenged and undermined books of the Bible. And 
He just, it is written, it is written, it is written. And each time the enemy shriveled and stepped back, came back again, shriveled, stepped back, and finally left for a while. And you're going to get bitten if you can't say it is written. You've got to be able to say it. You can't say it if you don't know it. When Jesus was challenged about his own identity, he quoted the word. And when facing accusation and the machinations of the Pharisees, again, inspired by the demonic, he turned and quoted scripture. When challenging the injustice going on in the temple, he quoted scripture. Even at his, that place of agony at Calvary, when he hung between life and death and entered into death to bring us life, he was quoting the book. And we need to be those who know this scripture. Again, C.S. Lewis in Screwtape Letters, the older demon teaching the young one, he says, don't let the, him, the Christian, open the enemy's book. Have him think he's not feeling spiritual enough. Suggest it's too complicated. Tell him he's too tired. Be vigilant. Five minutes of prayerful reading can set him back months. <laughs> We've got to be people of the book. And church is no substitute for your own reading of the book. It's a sword of the Spirit, sharper than any two-edged sword. This is where God's Spirit inspired it, alights upon it, and uses it to advance his cause and cut down the enemy. There have been many famous swords in history and in literature. I had a whole long list, but I haven't got time. So, but what about King Arthur? He had Excalibur, a mythic sword to establish his kingdom. An Aragorn son of Arathorn had Anduril, the fame of the West, to unite against Sauron and defeat him. And then Sigur, son of Sigmund, one of my favorites, he had Gram, with which he slew the dragon. You need a special sword when you're in a special battle. And we've been given one. This word of God, written over all those years by different people in different contexts and different literature and yet united by being, the, being inspired by God and revealing God and bringing us to God and instructing us how we should walk with God. And it's been collect, written and collated and treasured and passed on and transmitted to us. And we've got access to this treasure, this sword. Let's read it and use it you'll know we've all sung it or many of us will have sung it at school over the years the hymn from the poet blake i shall not cease from endless strife nor shall the sword sleep in my hand till we have built jerusalem on england's green and pleasant land or rather green and troubled land we need to be people of the book I need to finish. A while ago, I was invited to speak at Wycliffe Hall, uh, where they um, prepare ministers for ordination, train the ordinance. And the theme they gave me was to preach on the armor of God in Ephesians 6. Anyway, when it came to it, I agreed to it in advance, but when it came to it, I was so busy. I had like so many talks to sort that I, I thought I'll just try and get out of it. So I rang him up and I said, listen, is it possible that I could preach on something different um, uh, and uh, break the series that you're in? Anyway, very graciously, because they thought if I didn't do it, they didn't have a preacher. Um, they said, sure, you can do that. I thought, great, I'll just use something else I'm doing this week. Anyway, I went to the catacombs, which is our St. Aldate's prayer rooms, and I walked in and uh, I sat down, and as I looked across on the bin, I saw a page of scripture just sat on the bin, like that. I thought, what's all that? Anyway, I got up and I picked it up. And I was really annoyed, A, because you know, someone had sort of ripped out a page from scripture, and B, because it was being thrown in the bin. But it was this passage, Ephesians chapter 6. <laughs> There at the top, the armor of God. I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to ring them up now and say, I will preach on the armor of God. You know, I've got a visual aid. Don't rip it out and don't bin it. 
and that's true for us. This has everything we need to receive the blessing, to stand in the battle. Don't rip it out. Don't put it in the bin, but instead put it on. Amen. Let's stand, and we're coming to the Lord's table.